It's five o'clock Pacific time. I'm Marcy Winograd, coordinator of Code Pain Congress. So honored to be with you all tonight. I am co-hosting tonight with Cole Harrison of Massachusetts Peace Action and Jody Evans, co-founder of Code Pink. And we have our guests from Taiwan who will be with us throughout the show. Uh, retired Judge Julie Tang is with us. And we're gonna introduce you to the new coordinator of Code Pink Congress. But first we'll do a few updates and then we'll move forward with our agenda. Cole, what have you got for us? <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Marcy. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Concern has been rising across the world to reach a peaceful settlement of the Ukraine conflict. A lot of distinguished individuals have been speaking out, ranging from 66 countries at the UN General Assembly in September to uh, Pope Francis, Elon Musk, and even Donald Trump have all called for peace talks in, in Ukraine. But now in recent days, the attention has shifted to the threat of nuclear war. And um, this has uh, been a concern across society. Um, a new coalition has come together to defuse nuclear war and uh, held actions in almost 50 US cities last Friday uh, with six points, support congressional action to avert nuclear war, support the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, and the policy of first use by the United States, take US nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert, get rid of ICBMs and move the money to human needs, not war. And we in Massachusetts were able to organize six of those actions. We spoke to staff from members of Congress in five of them and to a member, Jake Auchincloss in the sixth. Um, so, um, uh, but now the uh, concern over nuclear war is also drawing attention to the NATO nuclear drills and uh, and Marcy's gonna update us on that. Yes, so NATO, well, 14 members of NATO, the United States being one of them, uh, is are conducting mock nuclear strikes, practice dress rehearsals uh, right now for the next two weeks in Europe. Uh, some of them are leaving from Belgium. They are, not carrying live weapons, we're told, but it involves 60 fighter jets, including B-52 bombers that do, are dual capable. And uh, I believe earlier during the war in Ukraine, this dress rehearsal was canceled, but now it's back on again. So please push back on that, write to the White House, tell them how you know, dangerous this is. So that's what I have to say for that. Uh, now I want to, it's my honor. Um, just to jump in, Marcy, yeah. there's actually an action page on this, which I will throw into the chat if anyone would like to take action quick on Terrific. the nuclear drills. Thank you, Cole. Uh, Jody Evans is the co-founder of Code Pink with Medea Benjamin, who often co-hosts Code Pink Congress with us. And I'm going to introduce Jody. She has a few announcements, and then she's also going to introduce somebody who will update us on what's happening in Okinawa before we go into the main part of our agenda. So Jody Evans, as I mentioned, the co-founder of Code Pink, is also the founder of the China is Not Our Enemy campaign. Since the start of the 2003 Iraq war, Jody has traveled to Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, Jordan on peace delegations. On her most recent visit to Jordan, Jody traveled with the Peace Coalition to meet with delegates from the Iraqi parliament to institute an action plan for peace and reconciliation. She was one of 30 women activists from 15 countries, this gives me chills, who crossed the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea to call for peace and reconciliation between the two countries. Welcome, Jody Evans. Thanks, Marcy. Thanks, Cole. I love Code Pink Congress. Yay. Yay. So thanks, all of you, for joining this conversation tonight about Taiwan, especially on a day when it's hot and escalating. But we've been watching for almost three years as the US State Department and the Pentagon have been driving a propaganda war on the hearts and minds of progressives. So we can be used of, uh, as tools um, as they push for a war on China. When I first started to see this and see how very similar it was to the same playbook and the drive to war in Iraq, we started the campaign, it could pink China's not our enemy. I'm sure China is many things, but not only are they not our enemy, 
But our task at this moment in history is to be working together for people and planet, to be cooperating, to be collaborating. We are in a full on climate chaos. It's happening around the world and war is the greatest industrial contributor. To be driving war right now is criminal. It's a violation to humanity. But the US military has been doing just this for years. There are already casualties to this war. There are Asian Americans in the United States. And I say Asian Americans because in the United States, we can't tell the difference. There are already prices being paid by the indigenous people in the Asia Pacific Islands where the US is placing bases and destroying pristine ecosystems. And we'll hear from someone there in a minute. We have had many campaigns and China's not our enemy to educate over the last few years. And it has helped to pull back progressive organizations, progressive members of Congress and people from being used by the propaganda. But we know that in the fog of war, which is where we are right now, everyone loses their minds. But those of us grounded in the commitment to peace and diplomacy, it is our task to educate. So tonight, you're gonna to get a lot of material that you can share. Um, and um, I'm so excited that we um, have guests from Taiwan and China. Um, you know, China is a proud country like all countries and they've been violated by the colonizers and um, they, they have, they're a million and a half a billion and a half people compared to our 330 million. Um, so, you know, what does that mean for us to disrespect them there? How do we listen to people in China and Taiwan? Um, so I'm happy that you're here. I hope our China's Not Our Enemy commu community continues to grow tonight. And with this special um, treat, we have people from China and Taiwan and they don't speak English. So I want you to look at your screen and take your cursor and drag it down to the bottom. And on the right of all those little images, it'll say um, uh, interpretation. So it's a, a world and interpretation. If you click your, your cursor on it, push English. And when you do that, you will be able to hear when our guests are speaking they're, what they're saying simultaneously in English. And that has been organized for us tonight by the team from Dongsheng News. And um, we'll put that in the chat so you can look at it. Um, they've assisted this gift for us. And also, if you wanna keep up with the news on China, check them out. So as I said, you know, part of this war on China is already happening in the islands and Asia Pacific. And Hideki Yashikawa is the director of the Okinawa Environmental Justice Project and the author of several major articles at the Asia Pacific Journal. Hideki is here to update us on the campaign to stop construction of a US military airbase at Hiniko Aurora Bay in Northern Okinawa Island. We're so happy you could join us. Thank you. Okay, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, great, good to see. Okay, uh, hello from uh, Okinawa, Japan. My name is Hideki Yoshikawa and I'm the director of Okinawa Environmental Justice Project. And thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to update uh, on what's taking place in Okinawa. At our project, we are trying to protect Okinawa's precious environments from the overwhelming presence of U.S. military bases here. One of the issues we've been working on is the uh, construction of a U.S. military base at Henoko Urabe, which is one of the most uh, biodiversity uh, rich areas in the world. Uh, we've been trying to stop this construction for almost 25 years, but <laughs> it's still, still uh, the construction is still going on. Um, as we are all aware, the political tensions between China and the U.S. and Taiwan are intensifying. And Japan, as a client state to the U.S. government, is taking advantage of this situation, trying to push 
its militarization and the militarization of Okinawa. And unfortunately, this fear mongering about the Chinese threats is spreading out through the Japanese government and the Japanese major media outlets. Some people in Okinawa see the militarization of Okinawa as unnecessary, which is very unfortunate. And so our islands are divided and we need to seek ways to counter this situation. But we have a good news as well. In September, we re-elected uh, Denny Tamaki as our governor for Okinawa. It was a landslide victory for him. And he ran his campaign on this uh, anti henoko based construction platform. The people of Okinawa, people of Okinawa opposed this Henoko project. The message was clearly presented to the US government and the Japanese government again. As for our project at the uh, Okinawa Environmental, uh, <clears throat> Environmental Justice Project, uh, we have been working on a letter sending campaign. In sep early September, uh, we sent our letters of request to the 30, uh, 32 US Congress people, uh, most of them in the uh, uh, Senate and the House Armed Service Committees. We urged them to take the initiative to stop the Henoko based construction. And thank you to US civil society organizations, such as the uh, Democratic uh, Socialist of America International Committee. We have 100 organizations, and amazingly, 32 US elected officials from the state and the local levels have signed onto the letter. We are very much, very much encouraged and we are very much excited. So we are hoping to get more organizations and the US elected officials to join the letter. And with that, with that, we are hoping to get or push the US Congress to have a hearing on the Henoko base issues. So please Google Okinawa Environmental Justice Project and please uh, read our actions and please join the letter sending campaign. Thank you we very much. We will do that. We will do that. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us and updating us. That is good news that you brought us tonight. And uh, I know I personally will do my utmost to get more people to sign on, more organizational representatives to sign on to that letter and to get it to members of Congress. And please, Hideki, post anything you want in the chat on how people can get in touch with you, learn more and that, that sort of thing. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Cole, you're going to introduce our next guest, please. Uh, oh, excuse me, Jody is going to introduce our next guest. <laughs> Jody, sorry about that. Cole's coming up later. Um, actually, you're going to introduce Wei. Sorry. Okay. Somebody will do the introduction. Here we go. Uh, Wei recently joined Code Pink as the China is not our enemy campaign coordinator. She was born in Tianjin, China. And she has lived in the United States since her high school years. Prior to joining Code Pink, Wei was a student researcher on neocolonialism and has worked with several nonprofit organizations serving women, racial minorities, and other progressive causes. Many thanks to Wei for joining Code Pink. And here she is. Wei, tell us about the Taiwan Policy Act. Yeah. Please. Mm -hmm. So um, by this time, I'm sure a lot of you have heard what the Secretary of State Antony Blinken had said uh, yesterday. So he was referencing a speech recently made by Chinese President Xi Jinping, and he claimed that Beijing has, quote unquote, moved to a faster timeline uh, with regards to Taiwan. So that's really just cherry picking and really twisting words um, from an article uh, in The Guardian that Ho Ping tweeted out this morning, um, it actually reported that a lot of analysts didn't find such thing in the speech. Uh, instead of any change in attitude towards Taiwan, there's actually an increase of frustration towards foreign interference. So Secretary Blinken was not just cherry picking uh, the speech, he was also cherry picking what's happened in the Asia Pacific for the past few years. We're all here today because we want to stop a war between the US and China from happening. But we must recognize that the war has already started for people in the Asia Pacific. 
we heard earlier from Mr. Yoshikawa about Okinawa. Uh, for the past year, we at Code Pink were also so fortunate to work with activists from Guam um, as their homeland is disrupted by US militarization as the US is gearing up for a war with China. The war with China has also started for Americans working in China and Chinese working in America. The most recent example being President Biden's recent sanction on the semiconductor and related technology that forced so many Americans to quit the jobs and uproot their lives. <laughs> and then now uh, we also have the Taiwan Policy Act, which we will hear from our panelists uh, to talk about today. Um, but just briefly, um, the act was co-sponsored by uh, Bob Menendez from New Jersey and also Lindsey Graham from South Carolina. And it was moved uh, forward in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on September 15th. The bill will have to be passed by the Senate, by the, by the House, and also signed by President Biden. So there is still time for us to do something with it. We just fear what the, the act would mean because it promises $6.5 billion in taxpayers' money for military aid for Taiwan. Well, that money could be used for to create uh, green jobs, for healthcare, and all that good stuff that we really care about. The bill would also uh, treat Taiwan as a major non-NATO ally, which again changed the diplomacy with Taiwan. And I'll let our panelists to get uh, to talk more about that. And we are all here because we want peace. Chinese people want peace. The people of Taiwan want peace. And we must hold US politicians accountable for their more warmongering. And I thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you all for all you do in safeguarding peace for people and our planet. Thank you, Wei. Uh, as I said in the chat, we are so fortunate and Jody, you know, thank you, Jody, for all the work that you've done on this campaign. But we and we are so fortunate to have Wei join us too. Uh, you know, there were a, a few people who voted in committee against the Taiwan Policy Act, and they may be allies we can reach out to. Uh, I can think of a few: Murphy, uh, Markey, uh, Reed. No, excuse me, Rand Paul and Schatz, and I think there was one more, but uh, those are those are the ones that come to mind. Okay, thank you, Wei. So next, I want to introduce our next speaker, who is retired Judge Julie Tang. She's one of the co-founders of Pivot to Peace and has been one of our partners for peace since we launched China is Not Our Enemy. Julie is a brilliant organizer and speaker who has been an activist with passion for all people and peace. I love being in action with her because her voice is clear, it's knowledgeable, it's deep, and it's full of love. Her community adores her and they'll show up for anything when she calls. Um, just recently, she was leading a couple of actions um, against House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan and you know, said it was reckless and unreasonable um, and, and useless. <laughs> so she also is never afraid to call out power. Um, I also wanna say that she helped to co-found the Comfort Women Justice Coalition that built the Comfort Women Memorial in remembrance of the girls and women sexually enslaved by the Imperial Japanese Army. We forget what these costs of war are and they are more borne by women. And um, the fact that we are, that war is being talked about so frivolously, um, Julie knows there's nothing frivolous about it. So Julie, I turn it over to you. You're my hero. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Great. Yes. Okay, um, Jody, the admiration is totally mutual. Uh, when you started the program, China is not our enemy. I, you, you, you have earned my utmost admiration. And every single person you brought on this program has been brilliant, smart, and, and, and a leader you know, in their own rights. So I'm happy to also welcome Wei to join us in our endeavor to forge peace between US and China. I am very happy to come and talk to you about the Taiwan Policy Act because it is truly a very important uh, thing that we need to uh, work on. Because if passed, it would upend a longstanding commitment made by the United States to China. The commitments are collectively known as the Joint Shanghai Communique. 
I was very surprised a lot of people in the progressive left do not know about this. And uh, when I explained to them that in that communicate, the United States and China agreed that one, there is one China and, and the People's Republic of China is the one China. And two, Taiwan is part of China. And three, any issues between China and Taiwan will be resolved by the Chinese on both sides of the strait. Now, this is very fundamental. And, um, and a lot of people are not even aware that America has made such a commitment to China and to the world. These three treaties jointly agreed to between US and China in 1972, 1979, and 1982 was signed into a binding agreement by three presidents, Nixon, Carter, and Reagan. And it became the bedrock foundation for a peaceful and normalized relationship between US and China for the next 40 years. It guaranteed the Chinese people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait a peaceful coexistence. And since signing um, that joint communique, China and Taiwan have actually enjoyed a very robust economic and cultural relationship. China became Taiwan's number one trading partner and still is. And they have made attempts to work out the political differences with each other. In 1992, under the Kuomintang government, which is the opposition government to the current one, China and Taiwan, through their respective representatives, entered into an informal but binding agreement known as the 92 Consensus. And this 92 Consensus basically affirmed uh, that there is one China and both sides will promote an economic relationship peacefully pending reunification between Taiwan and China. And with this consensus, Taiwan and China have enjoyed a peaceful relationship and their trade relationship flourished. The Taiwan government leaders visited China and were warmly received. But since the Kuomintang government lost its power to the current leadership of the Democratic Progressive Party, the 92 consensus has been bastardized and openly repudiated by the current Taiwanese government. And it has been a very unfortunate thing where uh, meanwhile, the current government has been asserting a very passive aggressive stance on independence and leaning closer to Japan, its former colonizer and the United States. And now we have the Taiwan uh, Policy Act in which the United States grants itself extensive involvement in the government and military of Taiwan. The core element of the act provides Taiwan with a 6.5 million aid in weapon acquisition. But yesterday I read that the, uh, they're adding another 10 million, $10 billion to it. I'm sorry, 6.5 billion aid, not million, 6.5 billion. And now they're adding another 10 billion. And with this money, the United States bestowed upon itself the power and right to govern and direct Taiwan's military and embedded itself in the Taiwan government for the next five years. The United States also appoints itself to determine and implement a wide range of Taiwan's policies. These policies cover the recruitment and military, military training for Taiwan's defense and the management and stockpiling of weaponry related resources. With Taiwan's military and the civil government firmly in the grip of America, Taiwan looks to me more like a colonial state than the sovereignty which it hopes to become. Unfortunately, after 50 years of colonization by Japan, Taiwan is walking into another, another type of colonization instead of a reunification with its motherland. And what I see is the United States is, is engulfing itself, itself more and more in a war in the Pacific, a war that the people in both Taiwan and China do not want. Just as Wei said, they wanted the status quo. For China's part, time is on its side and it would wait out for reunification as long as the Taiwanese government does not push its red line and declare its independence. And even American people agreed in the recent poll conducted by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, notwithstanding the negative views held of China by those who were polled because of all the brainwashing and demonization that has been going on against China, 60% of those polled agreed that the United States needs to learn to live with China, even though China would wield greater influence in the Asia region. And excuse me, China is part of that Asia region. And, and if they were to wield greater influences than the United States, that's the way it should be. And United States should really respect 
the terms and conditions of the Shanghai communique is not to assert hegemony and also to respect the sovereignty of China as a nation and the land that it be, uh, that belonged to it, uh, which is Taiwan. A war in the Pacific will have horrendous consequences to Asia and the world, and not one easy for the United States to win. The Taiwan Policy Act will push us closer to it. And just a little, little thing on this side, I wanted to share with everybody if I have a little bit more time, that there's so much corruption and, um, and menace that, that, that accompanies this Taiwan Policy Act in a wheeler dealer type of fashion in April. Shortly um, after, I think, um, well, in April, the two sponsors of this act, Menendez and Graham, had visited Taiwan. And there, who are they pushing for? Not the American people. They were pushing for the interests of the Boeing company, airplane Boeing company, and pushing to have Taiwan buy 16 Boeing airplanes after China had rejected them. And so, uh, of course, um, Taiwan couldn't say no. So they agreed to that. And now they have struck a deal. And then, so uh, Menendez and um, Lindsay came home with the good news for Boeing. And three months later, they introduced the Taiwan Policy Act. And if you just check the, the website, it's all open. This kind of money that Boeing has given to lobbying all the politicians is gross and embarrassing. And so I just wanted to put this in so that we know the perspective of the Taiwan Policy Act and why we should go against it is to defy these politicians attempt to sell out um, uh, America for, for, inch, for uh, put, um, these kind of interests and also to uh, push us closer to war irrespective of the consequences to Americans. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Jody and Wei. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share a few comments with you. I hope to discuss these issues more in depth later through our questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Tang. And uh, now I'd like to introduce Mr. Wang Wulan. He is a member of the Standing Committee of the Central Committee of the Taiwan Labor Party. He's Director General of the Taiwan Labor Human Rights Association and Executive Secretary of the Cross Strait Peace Development Forum. The Taiwan Labor Party calls for peace talks and peaceful reunification with the People's Republic of China. Their slogan is, one China on both sides of the Taiwan Strait for peaceful development, one China, one Taiwan for eternity. With Cross Strait reunification, the Taiwan Labor Party believes Taiwan will no longer be a new colony under U.S. control. Uh, Mr. Wang Wulan. Thanks, Cole. Um, Wei was going to show us some um, images of um, him in action before he starts to speak. And while she's showing those images, I want to just make sure that everyone has had a chance to go to the bottom of their screen to interpretation, the, 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 the little earth <laughs> symbol, click on it and take English so that you'll be able to hear what he has to say to us. If you're on a phone, you take it down and there's three dots to the right, open up those three dots and then um, go to um, interpretation and pick English. I, um, this is a real treat that we have someone from Taiwan to be able to share with us today. So sorry to disrupt. Um, it, I turn the, um, the time over to you, Mr. Wayne. Thank you. Copian 就好像台湾关系法一样是美国以自己的国内法干涉中国内政的台湾问题这个是一个典型的霸权主义行为是美国
作为一个资本帝国主义，为了摆脱自身危机，制造地区的紧张，加强支配控制，榨取该地区利益，作为肥大美国军工复合体和垄断资本的一项策划。台湾政策法里头提到台湾问题，但什么是台湾问题呢？什么是台湾呢？众所周知， 1 9 4 5年8月15日，日本投降，中国抗日战争胜利，收回因甲午战败被日本割据殖民统治的台湾澎湖列岛。中国作为战胜国，收回早先被侵占的失土。是有这样的历史事实和国际法理的依据，更是历史正义的体现。因此，台湾问题的实质，简单的讲，台湾是中国的一部分，目前是中国国家未完全统一的地区。台湾在历史上和法理上从来就不是一个国家，绝大部分的台湾人的祖先，至少超过。九成五的台湾人祖先是来自中国大陆。今天台湾人所讲的语言、写的文字，仍然是中国的语言文字。去年台湾对中国大陆的顺差超过一千亿美元。因此呢，台湾政策法案中的用语以“侵略”一词，来自美国的恶意虚构，更是美国欺骗世人的谎言。由此证明，台湾政策法的美国霸权、干涉主义性质。应该讲讲台湾是怎样成为美国的新殖民地区的。上个世纪，美苏冷战对抗，美国主导布置世界的反共战略。一九五零年，通过扶持中国内战中的国民党反动政权，侵占控制台湾，美国资本帝国主义干涉的结果，造成台湾问题长期化。台湾成为二战后被美国支配控制的新民新殖民主义体系的一部分。台湾不是现在才成为美国新殖民地的控制下，是从一九五零年。开始的，从历史来一看，新殖民地后进资本主义社会，实际上就是作为资本帝国主义维系全球性的主控体系的一种严密手段。这也是目前美国帝国主义经济危机深重，又有单极霸权衰落的焦虑。面对中国发展快速，加上中美之间在争。制制度、思想文化、意识形态等多个方面具有明显的差异，乃至处于对立线上。美国便视中国为全面性的战略竞争对手，加以对抗。因此，更要看到美国军工复合体、华尔街集团在多地策动转换政权的所谓“颜色革命”。制造地区纷争，煽动战争，从中获得巨大的超额利益。因此，美国帝国主义贪婪政客把台湾视为阻挡中国的棋子，这样势必带来严重的危险性，让人不安，是我们这一次关切讨论的重点。那什么是台湾政策法呢？台湾政策法是美国自身战略利益的需要。以台湾知名的作业，用来刺激中国、挑战中国的和平统一方针。他的目的在政治上，想要通过提升对台湾的关系，意图制造一中一台，破坏国际上普遍承认的一个中国原则。军事上则赋予台湾当局主要非北约盟友的地位，设立所谓的台湾安全。倡协助倡议，未来四年还要提供四十五亿美四十五亿美元的外国军事资金援助等，但这其实只是为了要更多的售台武器，意图打造台湾成为巨大军火库，成为前线战场。这明显的是为军火工业美国死亡商人赚取利益。我们要看到
二零一九年、二零二零年这两年，每年台湾都有超过一百亿美元的对美军购，在经济上则要是要胁迫台积电等重要的企业到美国设设厂。企图割断两岸之间自然的经济合作需要。更为恶劣的是，最近从美国媒体传出多则消息，美国有意在暂时破坏台湾岛上的半导体产业的消息，所谓的“毁台自中”的阴谋，这是非常让人愤慨生气的。美国与海峡两岸的和而不同，分而不离现状，符合其国家利益。更宣称反对单方面破坏两岸现状，但是美国在中美竞争下不断升级强化台所谓台湾牌的应用，使得台湾的台独分离主义越走越远。近年来，美方陆续出台国防授权法、台湾旅行法，再加上这部台湾政策法，难道美国不是正在改变台海现状，制造地区紧张情势吗？如今，台湾被工具化的处境，带至战争危险的道路，受到鼓舞暗示的台湾分离主义当局的以美谋独策略，正是后进资本主义新殖民地政权的一重现象。所谓的民主价值，只不过是资本利益的掩饰。我们应该看到，遭受挑衅的中国大陆方面，必定会加强维护领土主权的措施。日前针对佩洛西来台的环台军演就是一个讯号，因为解决台湾问题、实现法理与事实一致的统一中国，就中国来说属于主权方位的最高责任层次，是核心利益所在。开展反干涉斗争、反分裂，即属于正当的国家自卫行为。维护本地区战祸的方法，不是来自美国的干涉，而是要鼓励台湾海峡两岸在一个中国原则下，通过两岸交流，通过内部平等协商的方式，朝向完成国家的统一的道路就可以。因此，劳动党的口号是“两岸一中，和平发展，一中一台，永无宁日”。面对当前。台湾海峡严峻紧张的情势，我们劳动党站在台湾人民的爱乡爱国立场，主张应该促和谈、促和议、促和统。站在世界人民主义反对资本帝国主义的立场，我们反对美国霸权主义干涉中国内政、台湾问题，反对美国挑动海峡两岸战争，反对美国对台军售，反对台湾政策法，应该废止与台湾关系法。我们认为。两岸统一后，台湾不再是美日外部势力霸权主义控制干涉下的新殖民地处境，回到中华民族共同体的台湾人民才是真正的主人。与此同时，台海地区的持久和平稳定才能真正实现。没有美国外部的干涉，以军售台湾等方式对台湾财政的压榨，台湾的预算资源将可以用于。基层大众增加民生福利，因此我们呼吁台湾海峡两岸的中国人，还有世界上和爱好和平的进步人士，应该团结起来，反对美国资本帝国主义、霸权主义干涉中国台湾问题。呃，有看到有留琉球冲绳的朋友，我们在当年反对基业扯的时候，我们也去参加过，因为我们认识到。美日帝国主义、美日军事同盟，也是对于才是真正对于台此地区一个不安定的因素。以上。Thank you very much,、uh, Mr. Wulan Wang.、Um, we are so pleased that you could join us from Taiwan. And、uh, what you said is just so so important, you know, to remind us of the the call for reunification. So we're going to have a, a question and answer period in a minute, but first we're going to take action on Code Pink Congress. We always like to incorporate some actions for our audience rather than just、uh, 
telling us, you know, the dire situation, we want to do something about it. So Maha Khan, who's so graciously navigating the tech for us tonight, has posted in the chat the first action. We're just going to take a few minutes right now. Uh, it's a one-click action that Code Pink has sponsored, urged the Senate to not be used as a tool for war, to vote no on the Taiwan Policy Act. That's That was referred to as TPA, that's S4428, uh, specifically that, as Wei mentioned earlier, that would... Uh, give Taiwan or sell Taiwan six and a half billion dollars worth of weaponry to prepare basically for a war with China, uh, another U.S. proxy war. So I don't know uh, what your experience is, but when I sign these one clicks, I often do get a response from my senator on the topic. It isn't always what I want to hear or want to read, but I know that they have gotten the message. And so I ask that you take a moment. It's here in the chat. You just click on the link and fill it out and you'll help send the message to your own U.S. Senator. Okay, we're going to have a Q&A right now. So perhaps we could have uh, Judge uh, Julie Tang on the screen, along with Wang Wulan, Mr. Wang Wulan, uh, as well as uh, Wei, our coordinator for the China's Not Our Enemy campaign, and Jody Evans, the founder of the China's Not Our Enemy campaign. There we go. And uh, we can we can ask Mr. Hideki to join us too. We can uh, all fit in the same room and then we can open up uh, the chat for questions. All of this is related. Uh, I'll start off with the first question for the judge. Um, when... If you were going to trace back to when U.S. policy on Taiwan really subverted this idea of the one China policy, uh, when did it, what, what was the embryonic stage? When did this start? And of course, we've seen the, this escalate ever since. But if you could trace back, when would it be? It would not be possible for me to pinpoint an event or um, the start of a trend. I think it's always been there. Always been there to use uh, Taiwan as a pawn, a leverage um, uh, against China. You know, in spite of the uh, Shanghai communicate, I think that America has never really seen China as a total friend, just like it's never seen Russia as a total friend, nor accepted it. The simmering Cold War has always existed. You know, China and the United States has also had the Cold War uh, shortly after 1949. But I would say that it was uh, during the Trump administration that it was, you know, it all came to a head uh, with the start of the trade war. And it was like, it's a flooding that, that couldn't be stopped. And it's so unfortunate that right now, uh, that both, it is a bipartisan um, thing to be against China, and it is uh, they're serious. It's about the elites, uh, their consensus uh, that this this has to be this has to happen, and part of the uh, military industrial complex um, issues. Uh, it, it's it's um, it's forging forward almost like a um, like a faucet that couldn't be stopped. But this trend has has always been there, I think, and it's almost just. But when when China stopped become becoming strong, and also uh, especially with the uh, with the advances in the semiconductor uh, chips industry, that's when I think the United States started to get worried. And the neocons really jumped into it. They jumped into the fray. And we are a forever war a country. After Afghanistan, this war has terminated. And what, what is next? And they, they're looking at China right away, putting, them, putting China right there on the block. But this is something that we have to be very concerned about. And what I'm saying is that I don't think this is going to be short-lived. I think we're looking at a long haul right now, given the long animosities between the countries and the simmering discontents that the United States has with China and always the fear that China will take over the Asia region. And as it got bigger and bigger, um, they got 
more and more worried. So um, I hope I answer your question. Yes. And it's a very good question. I think it takes us to what we're going to be looking at ahead of us. You know, it will be a long haul. Yes. Thank you so much. Can I add something to that? Sure. So um, I think, you know, there was a time um, with Kissinger where China and the United States had a friendlier relationship. And that was when um, the U.S. was using China for its needs. And, um, you know, as long as China was going to do what the U.S. wanted and help, you know, like there, the U.S. was using China and its money and its capacities and, you know, and, and. Um, and it was really during Obama that the, sh the pivot to Asia happened. Um, and it's been growing, it's been catapulting since then. Um, I think by um, the U.S.'s concerns of losing its hegemony, as, as uh, Mr. Wang said. And um, I mean, I would actually love to hear from Mr. Wang the answer to that question, because we it took me a while to recognize it as a person in the U.S. I wonder what it felt like um, you know, if, if there's the same way where we felt, oh shit, there's a, a war coming, we can see the patterns of propaganda. What did that feel like in Taiwan? So I'm not, I'm not sure, Mr. Wang, so this was a question uh, Jody is posing to you. Was there a time in Taiwan where, where everybody said, whoa, what's going on? The US has now, uh, is now determined to take on China and use us. Tai 乃至於相信包括美國人民也好但為什麼他們不提出一個不支持台獨的政策法案呢那其實還應該再補充一點在民眾的心中。Thank you. Cool. <coughs> cool. Yeah, well, my question is, <coughs> so when the Taiwan Policy Act came up in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, five senators voted no, uh, 17, I guess, voted yes. So my question to any of the panelists is, what does this difference mean? How deep is this difference? Uh, what do the five who are against the Taiwan Policy Act, what is their view of what Taiwan policy should be? And how does it differ from the mainstream policy in Washington? I can kind of answer that because we had a camp because we've had campaigns and we've been educating members. I mean, you know, Cole, from the beginning of this campaign, 
and getting to members and to their staffs to talk about what this means, that it is not something light, that it is an act of war, that, that, that act, those acts of war um, are already affecting the people in the United States. I would say a couple of them get that the hate on China is being borne by Asian Americans and they understand that and they understand the escalation. There's also, you know, even people in the business world get that this is not a good thing to have happen. And some of them have that kind of a point of view. So I wouldn't say it's a unified point of view that has them pulling back on this, but enough of them understand that this has been moving forward for a couple of years and that, so, you know, there's actually a few senators that understand diplomacy doesn't happen with a vote in Congress or in the Senate. It actually happens between two countries. There's a few people that actually know that um, who have power in the United States. Um, so I would say for each of them, it's different. But those are some of the things we've been working on, including with you. Um, so. I think that's a really good question. I also read some of the comments that these five senators made after they voted no. Um, they were um, not very, you know, knowing, you know, where the where things are going. I don't think they were ready to jump in and 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 be the leader. But they were very right on it with the comments that they made. That they understood that um, why are we rattling this situation? Why are we pushing um, China to war? What do we get out of it? Uh, what is there in for Americans uh, with all this money being spent? Uh, they raised some very, very good questions. Unfortunately, their responses were kind of weak. I, I think they didn't want to be the leader. Um, and, and one was hedging a little bit, and then I forgot which one it was. I think it's uh, Holton, uh, Van Holton. He said that, uh, I think it may be him who said that, I'm voting uh, no, but I wanted to make sure that, that perhaps there would be some changes, you know, to the uh, Policy Act. So we really, um, before I vote, you know, at the um, uh, at the um, at the at the final with the final voting. So I think we need to follow up with with them also to make sure that they continue to uh, stick with the no vote and then convince some others. I'm hoping exactly. that um, there will be enough also pressure from the White House because I think I know the White House understands how big an implication this is. This is serious. I mean, this is really serious to allow Taiwan to use its flag, to allow Taiwan to change the office from economic and cultural representative to just Taiwan representative office, to allow them to participate in the United Nations um, as, as what? I mean, they're not even part of the country that belongs to the United Nations. The United Nations has uh, passed by resolution uh, the National Assembly declaring that there's only one China. So to, to give them that kind of presence is very, very dangerous. And I think that China is taking it very much in stride and, and more power to them. Very, 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 they, they are resilient. They are not jumping and, and, and you know, uh, <laughs> trying to catch the bait. But they're, they're planning, I mean, um, and Xi Jinping also said in this last Congress meeting, he said, we are very uh, respectfully, you know, waiting to work on this issue. But at the same time, we we will, you know, follow our res resolu resolutions to um, for the peaceful reunification. If if not, then we will be ready to use force. And I think they mean it. I mean, I've never seen China so resolute on any issue. You know, on uh, they they always resolute on a lot of issues. Actually, sorry about anti poverty and things like that, but. With respect to Taiwan, they have always been in that position that Taiwan is part of China. And I think that all of the people in China, and yes, I am making a generalization, but I think it is with some uh, foundation that it is true that people in China really want reunification. They're waiting for it. And that would be the same day that they celebrate the victory you know, of the war over Japan. That leads us to the next question uh, that was posed in the chat. And that is, uh, isn't the only way forward for Taiwan to hold a democratic referendum? I guess this is for Mr. Uh, Wang Wulan. For Taiwan to hold a democratic referendum, and if the people uh, vote to remain independent, then so be it, so long as they have a non-aggression pact with China, 
and no foreign bases. Um, I guess, uh, conversely, if the people voted in a referendum to be reunified, uh, that would perhaps settle it. Uh, so this issue, the question is, should there be a referendum on uh, Taiwan's reunification with China or independence? And I guess also this would be a question for Hadiki, should there be a referendum on Okinawa about the future of that military base? So first, uh, Wang Wulan, please. The question of a referendum. Taiwan 台湾是中国的一部分这是第一点是中国的一部分国家的统一才符合一个中国的原则认识到两岸的问题的危险性是不能采取这样的方式的。OK, okay, thank you. Um, what, uh, what about you, Hadiki? Uh, what are you sorry, Marcy, thinking? could I just quickly add sure. to that? Oh, sure. Um, I think um, especially the issue with ref the, the idea of a referendum is that everyone gets, gets a vote, vote, so everyone has a voice on this issue, issue. Um, but then a referendum within Taiwan will be dangerous because um, it's essentially giving the idea that Taiwan is treating this as its internal matter, whereas um, on the interna international level, this is actually a matter for China, for mainland China and also Taiwan. So if we really want to hear the voice for everyone on this matter, then there should be a referendum for not just all the people in Taiwan, but also all the people in China. And then yeah. Yeah. with that population difference, we can see where the bias will lay. And so that's why the idea of a, a referendum is not really the solution for the problem. Thank you. Hediki, uh, the same question, referendum on Okinawa about the military base. What do you think? All right, good. Um, the word or the concept of referendum is really, uh, very critical concepts in Okinawa, actually. So we can talk about the idea about two different levels. Uh, actually, we held a referendum in 2019, three years ago, against whether you know we accept the uh, construction of the military base at Henoko Ora Bay. And in that referendum, uh, we expressed, again, the oppositions to the construction. So in that uh, referendum, yeah, so we, we expressed again, but then the Japanese government just keep ignoring all the democratic voice of Okinawa people against the construction of base. So that's that's one thing. But also that we have a, a question of a referendum, you know, with regard to the whether Okinawa becomes independent or not from Japan. 
<laughs> that's a tricky issue. And uh, it's, but the, the fact that people were more, I think more people are talking about uh, before the past, uh, more people are talking about this idea of uh, in, uh, referendum regarding the independence of Japan itself indicates that how frustrated we are as Okinawans. Because again, you know, that we keep saying the no to the base, the overwhelming presence of the military bases, but it's just Japanese government and the US government just keep ignoring. Well, we want to support you as much as we possibly can. So do share that letter with us and we'll get people to sign on. Uh, at this point, we're almost, well, we are at the top of the hour and we have one other action that we want to take to mobilize opposition to the Taiwan Policy Act. So I'm going to ask Maha if you would kindly unmute and we can all thank our guests for joining us tonight. Some of you from Taiwan, uh, from Asia. So thank you so much. And I also want to thank the interpreters. Thank you so much. I know that was really hard and we deeply appreciate it. We thank you so much from China and Taiwan for joining us and sharing your Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I ask everybody to stay on, um, the participants. For Code Pink Congress, Amaha is posting in the chat. There we go, action two. If you scroll up a little in the chat, you'll see tell your US Senator to vote no on the Taiwan Policy Act because it would dismantle the one China policy to escalate a war with Taiwan, between Taiwan and China, a proxy war, US proxy war. So uh, right now, I'm gonna ask that you please take your phone in your hand. We're gonna give our senators a call and tell them what we want. We want them to vote no on the Taiwan Policy Act. And that is, excuse me, S4428 is the bill number. Okay, it's, uh, it has left the committee, Senate Foreign Relations Committee to head to the Senate floor. So Maha, if you have any music you wanna play, be my guest and we'll make a few calls.
All right, I think we will bring our time together to a close. It's about seven minutes past the hour. Thank you so much, all of you who stayed with us uh, for this second action. And again, thank our guests. Uh, Cole, if you wanna say goodbye or any announcements that you have, and now would be the time to share. And on uh, the peace, I hope. <laughs> thank you to our guests. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Jody, uh, for a great program. This is such an important issue and we have much more education to do. This was a great start. Yes. And I do wanna invite everybody who's interested in peace in Ukraine to join us, we do have a coalition piece. It's www, I'll put it in the chat, peaceinukraine.org. Uh, we will be meeting Mon uh, tomorrow, actually, Wednesday at uh, 1.30 Pacific time, 4.30 Eastern time. And we are all about uh, investing in climate, not in weapons, and calling for a ceasefire and negotiated peace. Jody, how about you? You wanna say goodnight? Yeah, I just I want to thank Hideki and Julie and Wei and, you know, just Marcy and Cole, thanks for bringing us together to learn and engage. Just such a gift. And thanks for everyone for listening and learning with us. And so thank you very much, Mr. Wang. It's been lovely to have you. Um, thank you for sharing from your passion, you know, from your passion. We're passionate activists. It was refreshing to feel your passion and your activism. Yes. I second that. And Wei, uh, do you want to let people know how they can get involved? Well, okay, absolutely. Okay. Um, so our campaign's webpage, it's just coping.org slash China. Um, you can also find us on Twitter at, uh, what is our Twitter handle actually? Uh, it's China Not Enemy, uh, which is different from our campaign name. And I'll put both of them in the chat as well. Thank you so much, Marcy. Oh, yes. Thank you. Ed. Um, here, I'm thank also you. putting in chat the uh, website yeah, for our coalition, which uh, Maha maintains. This website does such an amazing job. And so, it looks like Julie wants to say goodbye. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, Jody. I really appreciate it. You're such an inspiration. You know, we've, we've stolen your uh, slogan, China's not our enemy everywhere. And, and it just shuts people up. You know, when we're talking, I, we, we, when we were at Washington DC last week, uh, we met some liaison to the white house and she was going on and off. And so finally said, China is not our enemy. And she looked at us like, like, what are you talking about? She's not, she can't say back to us. Yeah. China is not our end. China is our enemy because China really is not. So thank you so much for your leadership. And I hope I did the best I could, oh, you know, I think you thank you're always terrific. so well. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I think, I think you're right. It was uh pivot, you know, that, uh, um, Biden's pivot, uh, no, I mean Obama's pivot to peace, but unfortunately, but fortunately for China, it got it got stalled because of the financial situation in in um, in America. And after China rescued us, then we started <laughs> clobbering China <laughs> under the I Trump know, administration. <laughs> I didn't bring this uh, this up earlier, but that's what I've never understood. You know, China owes uh, owns over a trillion dollars of U.S. debt. So what are people thinking? Yeah, really. I mean, they they they, they rescued us. Obama called uh, China and said, uh, "Would you help us out?" And China, sure. You know, we'll buy your, you know, your treasury bills or bonds or whatever to the tune of, I think, I uh, was billion dollars. Yeah, billion dollars, whatever amount of money that it took, and they bailed us out. And then now we, right after that, then we turn around and said, "Okay, now you know we're we're out of the." out of the red and we're going to go after them. So that's what, what it comes down to. But thank you so much. I, um, you guys are my inspiration to keep working on what I need to do here in San Francisco. Thank, Ms. Wang, you. thank you so much. I know thank it's you. super early. Thank you so much for being with us. And we hope you'll uh, feel free to share with us again. Um, you know, we'll connect you to Way so that you can keep us informed and smarter over here. Yeah, can I just say something to Mr. Uh, Wang? Uh, Mr. Wang, thank you so much. I'm really touched. I heard your words. You are from Taiwan. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. Because you are very strong. They are very strong. They are very strong. We are not in the United States. So I understand your experience now. Thank you so much. 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 I just thank Mr. Wang for what he has done and what he's doing in Taiwan. It's just not easy for him to do what he does because the people there are so bad, so so rough, you know, and 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 they're just violent and they're they're just they they would tear him apart. But he's still there and then doing what he's doing. So thank you, Mr. Wang. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Wang. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. 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 Th